if you have your uh, chart out and handy, we'll, we'll look at that and just make references to it. And then Lesson 9, and essentially we're going to go through Lesson 9 tonight. And we're going to talk about the, the future active indicative. We're going to look at it in regards to uh, first form and then function. How do we compose it, put it together, and then how does it function? And the function aspect, I, I give you some examples. It's not by any means exhaustive, but we did this looking at present active indicative, the different ways in which tense can be used in that and voice. So we'll, we'll do the same thing with the, the future active indicative. And then lesson 10. So this is the perfect. And so the, the flow of the chapters basically is following this. We're dealing with primary tenses. And so it's sort of how I ordered the, the lessons to follow this. So we'll cover the primary tenses first, and then we'll look at uh, secondary tenses because they all share the same endings and so on. But we'll see how tonight, like how the future is likely came from the aorist subjunctive. And I'll give you some examples up on the board. And if you want to, Jerry, open your Greek text to Luke chapter 1. Make, make some reference it, to it tonight so it might be easier for you to have it there and not have to go. Luke chapter 1, primarily verses 14 and 15. I, I just only drop because I've been reading through it since it's coming up on, on Christmas time, and I like going back through the narrative and, and reading, and it's just the statements are, are absolutely mind-blowing to me. But anyway, <clears throat> fortunately we can't get into all of that one. It'd be nice. I, I might share one with you from John chapter 1, verse 18. Interesting. All right, so we're looking at, primarily we're looking at Regular verb, Lou, that's our example. Uh, we'll look at some contract verbs and the me verbs later. But essentially we're dealing with regular verbs and we're dealing with everything above the line. This is reality, below the line is potentiality. So above the line, that's the indicative mood. Everything in the indicative mood is we're dealing with reality. Anything below that, subjunctive, imperative, infinitive, participle, we're, we're dealing with potentiality. Um, and the only element of time is found above the line, and that's with the augment placed on the front of the words, the epsilon. And we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the secondary tenses, the aorist, imperfect, and pluperfect. Where did the augment come from and that, and, and so on. So, But primarily we're looking at the in, in top here, and we're looking at the uh, primary tenses, which is the present, the future, and the perfect, and they all share similar endings. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about tense stem. We did already, but we'll talk about it in the reg regard to the future. The sigma is the, the tense stem for the future. So essentially, if you just take that and add that onto the present active indicative, you basically have made the future. And then the, the perfect active, we have uh, kappa alpha, and we'll look at that as we, we go on. But they share the, the same endings when it comes to making the form. So primary tenses, present, future, perfect. The active endings are mia ct, menta, nsi, which came from nti. And so the, the tau before final yoda, it ended up becoming a sigma. And it's just the issue of pronunciation, t, i, right? E, t, t. And it ended up changing to a sigma, right? Then liquids and sigmas don't go together, and then that brings about the change. But these are the, the endings for primary tenses. And then the secondary tenses are built off of these, and so we'll see, we've seen the similarities, and we'll see them as we go through. So if we get these down, then we come to the secondary tenses, and you'll start to see these endings all over the place, and you'll start to recognize them. The interesting thing is that participles will share this ending right here, men, but then you'll have a declension ending at the end of it. So you'll have men, but then you'll have two other letters or what have you for whatever declension is added to it, because the participle is part verb, part noun. Right? So we'll just start to see these, these forms all over the place, but they all started here and developed out of this. So the primary tense endings for active voice, you have me, c, t, men, te, and n, c. And you'll, you'll notice, we start walking through, these will be the easiest to pick up the plural form, the men, the te, and the c. You'll just start to see these everywhere and just know that those are the, the, second, the, the second plural, if you will. So if we take the, the root or the stem of the verb, if we're going to build a verb, so if we take the regular verb blue, 
We want to make present active indicative. We add the endings to this, me, she, t, right? And this is the singular forms, not the plural forms. So it is I, you, he, she, or it, right? And for the last one, context will we'll determine for you. And then we have our connecting vowel, our variable vowel, omicron before mu and nu, epsilon before everything else. And in the case of luami, the mi was the first, the mi verbs were the first verbs that existed, and they were built off of the aorist, the simplest forms. But when we drop a letter, we have to have what? What happens to the vowel? I hear it. Compensatory lengthening. So when we lose a letter, there has to be lengthening of the vowel that precedes it, and that's where we got the omega from. And that then becomes the, the, the form. And any, any vocabulary verb word that you find will have the O ending, the omega ending. But then you'll come across did me also in your, in your uh, dictionaries and so on. But me is where it started, the omega came later, Johnny come lately. With the second form then, second person singular, we have an intervocalic sigma, right? So intervocalic sigma dropped out because they don't like S's, and so there's so many different areas in which the sigma started to drop off in the Greek language. It's just something that they didn't care for. And so it resulted in a bunch of changes. So the intervocalic sigma drops out. When we lose a letter, we get compensatory lengthening, and there we see A. And then they attach the sigma on the end to differentiate it from the third, right, the third singular, which was et t, which became et c, right? So for expediency, we say that the tau, before the, the, the final iota dropped out, but it actually it, it, it acquiesced into a sigma, and then it, it ended up dropping. So we have compensatory lengthening, and we have luo luis due. So I am loosing, you are loosing, he, she, it is loosing. If we make the plural form then, we take our, in this case, root. Most often, you're going to be working with stems. Till you, the more you become familiar with the language, you'll start to pick up on the roots and see them. Uh, in some of the forms, you'll see the root pretty clear. But that'll come over time as you, the more vocabulary you learn, the more you learn the this, this markers for the different tenses and so on. But here we have men, tet, and si, our connecting vowel or variable vowel, omicron before mu nu, epsilon before everything else. And in this case, we have liquids and sigmas don't go together. In this case, the liquid is going to drop out. And we have compensatory lengthening. And we have luusi. So I'll just tell you, wherever you see ace, thinks ents, us, ants, right? Get that little ditty in your head. And as we go along, I'll give you some more to, to sort of keep in there. And, and you'll start to see this all over the place. You'll see that ooh and a, and you'll know something happened there that changed. And over time, you'll, you'll know what caused it. So then we have the plural forms. We have we loosed, you loosed, and they loosed. <clears throat> so the nice thing for the Greek, you have the distinction between the you singular and the you plural. In English, we don't have that. And, and most of the time we can determine English-wise which is singular, which is plural, but sometimes you'll find yourself looking at the Greek text to, to discern which it is. That's the one unfortunate thing about the dismissal of the King Jimmy. The new King Jimmy, they wiped out the D's and D's and those were helpful. So these are our endings that we're dealing with and we're going to then make present active indicative of Amy. Now Amy is interesting, it doesn't have voice active or passive. It just, it, it reflects a stative. So it's sort of a copulative is, right, or was, or it gives the idea of will be in the future, but it's a stative verb. But it follows the exact same rules as we make it. So S is the, is the root, and we have the first one, S me, Right? Liquids and sigmas don't go together because mu is also a liquid, right? So what happens? In this case, we lose the sigma. What do we get? Compensatory lengthening, we have a me. <clears throat> so that is I am. Then we have SC, right? Intervocalic sigma drops out. Compensatory lengthening, we have a. Right? So whether it's at the beginning of a word, right? Or it's the word itself or at the end you're going to know there's, there's change that's taking place there. And then we have SD, 
Esmen Este and this one, Essensi, which is interesting because you lose both the liquid and the sigma and it becomes a C. And the accent on the end is the reason why it just is the iota instead of epsilon iota. And also the redundancy. If we would have left it, if we go back, see if we would have left it and just dropped these two and then we had compensatory lengthening, ese, right? So what they ended up doing was they just made it a sigma and an iota and then they took the accent at the end, the last syllable. So I am, you are, he, she, it is, we are, you are, and they are. And then we'll look at how you make the, the future of this. And then all you do is uh, just going to add a sigma. And that's the tense, tense stem marker. So the pattern is everywhere. It's, in, it's just in verbs to be. Copulative, that's what we refer to this as that. Most of the time when you find this, you're going to find it in the case of with a perfect tense, which in a very more emphatic way is establishing state of being or condition. Right? And so if the author wants to, to highlight that more significantly, then you'll find perfect tense plus a form of a me alongside of it. So the future active indicative. The future tense is primarily an indicative tense. Uh, outside of the indicative, the future is rarely used in the New Testament, so we won't find it in very many other forms. The future optative doesn't even occur, and then actually by the Koine, Koine period, Greek period, which there, <laughs> there were technically several Koine periods. The only reason why we recognize the time the New Testament was written was that was when, in, in the case of the Greek language, was the most solidified, the most unified, and from that point on it stayed that way. There were other periods in Grecian history where they united themselves together and there was a bit of a uniting of the language. Whenever they, you had different city-states gather together to fight against a common enemy, but Alexander was the one who took all of the city-states and bound them all together as one solid people group, and then he went all over the empire. And so that's when everything was bound together. But by New Testament period, the future optative wasn't used, faded out of existence, and the future infinitive is rare, and the future participle, it's a little more frequent, but it's not very abundant. So most of the time you find the future tense is going to be in the indicative mood. Okay. So if you look at it this way, if we look at here's the, the future active and middle and then the future passive, if you look below the line, there aren't any forms given for the subjunctive, imperative, infinitive, or participle. Okay, because they're, they're infrequent or they don't exist. So for the future, primarily you're going to find it in the indicative mood. So the future tense and the aorist tense are similar and quite likely kindred in form. If you look at so the future active, luso, you notice with the aorist active, the indication is the sigma plus the alpha. So with future tense, you have the sigma, that's the, the, the tense stem. That's what tells me it's future. Same thing with aorist, but you have the alpha on there. The other thing about the aorist is that you have the augment on the front. If you look at the, the future passive, now it's interesting because the future is going to use the middle and passive endings. My, psi, this is psi. Okay, so my, psi, tie, it's going to use the, the middle and passive endings, but for the future passive, it's going to take theta, eta. And the same thing with the eris passive, it also takes the theta, eta. And there's evidence, as far as the Greek language goes, if you look back in the history of it, that likely the future arose out of the eris subjunctive. So I'll give you an example. Here's the air subjunctive and the future active. Now, this is interesting because you will come across, and it's very rare, and I was trying to think of a passage I know of one where you'll run across this problem, and it's not coming to me, but it will come likely after class is over with, where you have to deliberate, is it a future or is it an air subjunctive? Okay? But look at the two forms. The first one is an air subjunctive, the other is future, exactly the same. So you will find this in, in the context. Context will tell you which one it is. Okay? It doesn't happen often. It's very rare, but it, it happens. So if you look all the way down, this is second person singular, luces, which is the air subjunctive. And when you pronounce it, they sound exactly the same. Luces, luces. This is the third person singular, luce and luce. 
Then we have the first person plural, and notice the men. So we know this is the, the first person plural, the men. We have the future, right, stem, and then we have the heiress stem, and then here the difference is in the heiress you have the long O, and in the future you have the short O. Lucete and Lusosi and Lususi. So basically it's just the first person singular that you're going to run into difficulty with. But all the rest you'll tell by, by the elong elongated vowel. And this is nice to know too because when you drop below the line, everything above the line you're going to see the epsilon or omicron. That also helps us determine the, the mood if it's indicative in that. When you drop below, you find getting the length and form of the vowels that mark them off. That's something that will come with observation as you go through the language. But the future tense and explained is to form, and this is part of it's in your notes here. But the future tense is one of the primary tenses in Greek. And the primary tenses are the present, the future, and the perfect. And the reason why we deal with them all together is because they all share the same endings. They all take the primary tense suffixes, and they have their uniquenesses, so the, the kappa and alpha for the, the perfect, and then the sigma for the future, but essentially they all share the same endings. So these are the endings for primary tenses. We have the mi si ti, men te n si, mai si tai, meta s te n tai. All right? So watch him. If you look at Luke chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, so verse 14, we have chi, right, and, okay, and then notice, estai. That's the verb, that is amy, that's the copulative amy, okay, but that's the future form of it. The sigma, and then the tie ending. And you'll notice on verse 15, same thing. He will be great, estai. So both of those are future. Uh, in verse 14 of Luke 1, we have chi, estai, estai. That's our, our future form. So both, both verse 14, estai, and in verse 15, those are both future. And if you look at verse 14, kareisantai, you see that last word in verse 14, right? Notice the ntai, so that's middle or passive ending, right? The omicron, my connecting vowel, and then the sigma, that's my future tense stem. All right? So the verb stem is kare. For now. The triliteral root, kar. So, so the verb stem is kare. The first four, right? Mm-hmm. So that's your verb stem. Which tells us what the word itself means, right? That's exactly. Right. Exactly. From there, once you understand Recognizing that, you'll realize then if it's an I will or just or if it's whether it's plural or singular, and that's what it's telling us, right? Or yep. Or so it, it goes with the word paloi, many, many upon the coming of him, they will rejoice. So, kare from Cairo to rejoice. The try little root is kar. The, so the verb stem is kare. Sigma is future. Will. Omicron is my connecting vowel. And then ntai is my middle and passive ending. Right? So it is they will. Right? So if we look up on here, 
So ntai, so this is my middle passive third person plural, right? And it is they will. So they will be rejoicing. So essentially that's, that's what we're doing is we learn these endings, what they indicate, and the, the, the stem markers, whether sigma, sigma alpha, kappa alpha, when we start to recognize those, every one of those little elements tell us something. So when we're parsing a verb, that's what we're doing is we're breaking it down. We're pulling the parts, right? So the things that you recognize, then you get that verb stem, then you can go down to its root, right? The more that you grow in your understanding language, you'll start to see the roots, and, right? And you can break it down even further than that. So then when you do a study, what we look up car, caro, care, you'll look at the, the etymology of the word, how it was used over time. Then you look at the, the tense stem marker. What does that tell me? Future, right? Present, whatever. And then if I look at the ending, ntai, what else does that tell me, right? And that'll tell you if it's, you know, the kind of action. Is it over a long period of time? Is it a punctiliar? happens one time, past, future, all that kind of stuff. So that's all we're, we're trying to do is to just figure out all those little those keys right there and when we can do that and then they just each one unlocks a door for us. And you'll notice then in, in verse 14 the, the shared elements. First part of the verse is talking about Zechariah and, and what he is going to experience. It will be uh, joy and extreme or extreme exaltation and joyfulness for you and to the many, the paloi, upon the coming of him there will be rejoicing. And then verse 15, he will be estai, garestai, for he will be megas, mega. He will be mega and opion in the presence of two kuryu. And an opion is awesome because op is to see, and the preposition n on the front is to see down in. So when God looks down into his life, this is what he will be. He will be great in the sight of God. He will be megas. So when you get in a context like that too, then you, it's nice because you'll see the future all through it. Like when Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, there is that transition from, from present to future, and the verbs lead up to that. And then when it hits that point, then you have future comes after that. And you see that nice division in the context. But then when you know that, then you'll look at it and know, I'm going to find a bunch of future forms down through here. So essentially the future tense is obtained by adding a sigma to the verb stem, then the connecting vowel or thematic vowel, omicron, epsilon. It is added and finally the verbal suffix. So if we take the, the regular verb lu, we have lu plus the sigma plus omega, which is our, our suffix. We have lu so. So then when we parse it, we pull each one of those elements apart. Nice thing with nouns, we don't have that much to pull apart. You have basically the stem of the noun, and then you have the ending, whatever right case it is. So the noun's easier. When you get the participles, you have a mixing of two different elements. So you've got some picking apart to do there. And then if you have a compound form, if you have several prepositions attached to the front, kata nopion, kata and op, right? So you can have these mega long words that take several words in English to translate. It's just one word, but each element has its significance to it. And then you find those rare words, like when Paul, he refers to the hetera de daskaloi, the, the other teachers, right? Teaching another doctrine. You'll find these terms that, like, he coined that one. It's nowhere else in extra biblical literature or in the Bible other than Paul. So he coined that term to describe these, these teachers. And so then you find those, and those are what we call hapax legomena, those spoken only once in all the scripture. And those are important when you notice that because you realize this is unique. This only happens here and nowhere else. So then you know that there's significance to that. So the verbs and ending in vowels, 
like Lou, the formation of the future active indicative and the future middle is just is fairly easy to do. You just add the sigma to it. However, if you add it to a stem that has a consonant, depending on the consonant, will determine the change. Okay, so we'll we'll look at that as we go. But here is simply the simple form. This is from present active indicative to future active indicative, and all we do is add the sigma to it, right? And we can form the, the singular and the plural forms. And this dawned on me when I was studying Hebrew, because in Hebrew you start realizing there's patterns like the nifal and hifil and all that, that there are different pointings that happen for each one. And so like the, the nifal, you have a new involved in the process. And so when you st I started noticing there are these, just these keys there, I realized I don't need to be memorizing all these lists. I just need to know what those keys are and how to formulate the word. And then I can just work with those elements and then I'm good. And then you just work on your vocabulary and get your, your words down. So essentially, with the future tense, this is what we're looking for. Whether it's future active, future middle, or future passive, we're always looking for the sigma. Luso, lusamai, or luthesamai. So notice with the future middle, here is my my side tie, right? This is my, my ending. If you look at your chart here, these are my middle and passive endings, right? So this is my middle and passive ending. So uh, it's here, and it's also for the passive. But with the er future passive, it's like the aorist. It also takes a theta, eta. So for the future passive, I have three things that I'm going to indicate it. Here's middle passive ending. Here's my future for my S sigma for the future, and then my theta, eta for the passive form, right? And that's what distinguishes between future passive and future middle. Future middle is just lusamai, right? And for the future passive, it is luthesamai. And then if we come to the verb to be, I will be, or if we do the plural, we will be, same thing. There's my sigma, right? Just like the S tie. So we have, even with the, the verb to be, we have the same endings. My, psi, tai, metha, esa, entai. And then here's my sigma for the future. And then actually, this right here is my root. Cool? All right, so verb stem changes then in the future tense. Okay, the, for the verb stems ending in a consonant, certain changes take place when the sigma is added to the stem. So this is going to take us back to our alphabet. Now you have examples in your notes there, so you can go back and, and walk through that. But essentially we said that C was a combination of what? Kappa, right, and sigma. And this symbol came to represent that combination, X, right? We said for P was a combination of P plus sigma, right, that it gives us our P. But we, in this case, with the alveolar, tau, and sigma, right, because they share the same point of articulation, t -s -t -s, right, that there is not actually, there was a tau and sigma, but it just, all it did was assimilate it, and it just became a sigma. But notice here we have zeta represented as a sibilant, and I'll explain to you why. But essentially with zeta, when it occurs on the front of a word, it's z in our pronunciation like z. If it's in the middle of a word, is like saying combination of delta and sigma, z, right? So if I say pads, z. So the Greek word, if I have the zeta in the middle, sodz, sodzo. But if it's at the front of a word, zoe for life, right? So sodzo, zeta in the middle, zoe, zeta is at the beginning. So in the middle, it's a sibilant. At the beginning of a word, it's not, right? So that's why we, we classify it the way that it is. So changes that happen, again, remember, it has to do with sound, the phonetic element of it. So in your notes, you have this verb stems ending in a guttural, kappa, gamma, ki, or a labial, p, beta, phi, experience the following changes. And these aren't going to be crazy foreign to us, right? So essentially this, rules of change for future tense. 
If I have a stem ending in a kappa, gamma, or a key, and I attach a sigma to it, it becomes xi. Xi. Okay? So essentially, the xi was a representation of kappa and sigma together, and that symbol symbolized it. So then, over time, whenever you had a stem that ended with these letters, that's what it became. It came xi. All right? So, ago, our future is axo. Axo. So essentially then if I'm making it, I'm going to add my sigma right between the gamma and the omega. And as soon as I do that, right, it's going to cause it to change to this. Oxo. P beta phi, if I attach the sigma to the end of a stem that, that ends with one of these letters, it becomes psi. So blepo becomes blepso. So when you look at this, right, when I see ps, I know that that's my future. Verb stems ending in an alveolar. Tau, delta, theta experience the following changes. So, tau, delta, theta, if it is the end of a verb stem and I attach a sigma to them, they drop out. And therefore, my, my verb peto, right, becomes peso. Verb stems ending in a liquid, lambda, mu, nu, rho, experience the following changes. So if we have liquids like we know, together with sigma, they don't go together, right? Liquids and sigmas don't go together. So menso becomes meno. And you'll notice then the accent is here, but as soon as I lose my sigma, this becomes accented. And that tells me, right? So if I see the accent at the end, and no sigma, I know. And this is more of a, a rare term, so don't sweat it. Most of them will be very clear to you. You'll see like blepso is easy, oxo is easy, right? In, in that sense. But when you get to like meno, Right? It might be a little bit more trickery to figure out because you don't have that presence. See, with DC, you have the presence of the sigma there, right? Blepso, oxo. But with meno, you don't have the presence of it. And then verb stems ending in a sibilant, xi, psi, and in this case, zeta. So, sozo, if I make this a future active indicative, it becomes so so. And essentially, it's just like when we de-aspirate. So if you, if you take tithemi, was originally thithemi, right? So they don't like two aspirated letters on the front. So the first one is de-aspirate. It goes from thithemi to tithemi, right? You de-aspirate. De you take away the ha, huh, and you just have the tau there. Well, essentially, it's the same thing with sozo, right? It's just dropping the delta off of it, and it's just the sigma that's left, right? And you, but you know that, that that zeta there is a combination of two. So all, all you're losing is the delta and then the sigma is left. So these are our active endings, primary suffix, me, c, t, men, t, n, t, singular and plural, middle of passive for the singular and plural forms, my, psi, tai, metha, esse, and n, tai. And part of the reason too why I put them this way is so that you can see that the, the secondary tenses eventually we're going to see, but the the middle passive forms are built off of the active, right? So you can see the progression of the language and the changes that happen in the different forms to represent what they wanted. So all essentially you have is you just take these forms and you add an alpha in between them, right? Same thing with here, and then n tai, right? And n t.
And what you will actually find for you is that the plural forms will be easier to recognize and, I, and likely those will become uh, more fluid for you than the others. And you'll be able to see the second person, second plural forms quicker than you'll see the, the singulars. So future tense explained as to its function. You know what time we got? All right. So introduction there. The, ten, the future tense is primarily an indicative tense, and the future indicative expresses an anticipation of event in the future. The kind of action may be either punctiliar or linear. Okay. So when you have in, in Philippians 1, he says, I, I rejoice, and indeed, again, I will continue to rejoice. In that particular context, it is linear. I will go on rejoicing in the future. All right? But we also have elements of when it will be punctiliar, just stating a future act that will occur. Like in the, in the context of Zacharias, you will name him John. Well, he's not going to keep naming him John the rest of his life, right? It's that one moment, right? But the context will tell you whether it's the kind of action is punctiliar or whether the kind of action is linear, right? So that you'll have to discern by context. This is why it is, you can't escape the necessity of context anywhere. Whether you're doing a word study or whether you're trying to figure out the, the significance of this form, what is it being used as, right? Or the, the, the function of it, everything goes back to context. All right? This is the difficulty. People ask me about good books for doing word studies. I'm always cautious because, you know, there's, there's books out there like Vines. I think Vines is good, right? And he also has, they, they combine, the, they have Old Testament and New Testament, so you, you can use Vines. But again, the tendency is to, to see the word in abstraction from his context and then take that understanding and read it into every context in which you find that word. But you can't necessarily do that. Ecclesia is an example. You can't read the etymology into every context in which you find it. First Corinthians, you can. Acts 5, you can, that we are the called out community. When you look at First Corinthians, Paul make, is making that emphasis all the way through the letter. So you can absolutely build everything you want out of the etymology of that word. Other times, it's just the assembly, the church, right? And, and any kind of significance of called out in that isn't necessarily born out there. The other term that... that find oftentimes is used too much is the term that we use for repentance or conversion and it literally in its root means the change of mind but the significance of that isn't always borne out every time in every context so just to say context is vital and everything needs to be weighed by that so when you do a word study and you've breaking it all down take it back to the context and say well how does this fit here right so yeah, I'll give you an example this is a really crazy one we're going to get to it in Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. This I find very intriguing. I'll push it on time here a little bit. But. So Ephesians chapter 1. So if you look at Paul's prayer, verses 15 and following in chapter 1, So I'll read to you the English first and we'll look at it. He says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease, verse 16, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And this is what then he prays for, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now it's interesting because he's, he's looking to the future. I want him to give you this, right? I want him to give you this spirit, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge of him. But in verse 18, he uses a perfect tense. That the eyes of your heart standing in the state of being opened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and inheritance and saints. We'll come to this when we get to Ephesians, but just ponder that because it's, it's intriguing that, so this is a prayer quest for something in the future, but in verse 18, it's a perfect tense, which is something that has happened in the past and the results are abiding. Why, when he is praying for future things to come upon them, does he have a, right, a perfect tense in there? 
So this is one of the, the things in Ephesians that, that one must wrestle with. So I had a brother t today who was texting me questions on Ephesians uh, 1, 4, and 5. Where does the prepositional phrase in love go with? Does it go with verse 4? Does it go with verse 5? There are a lot of those kinds of elements in here, but just I'd leave that for you to ponder on. It's, it's intriguing. But again, just weigh that by the context. So, okay, now I have future here, futures over here, and then here I have a perfect. What's he saying by that, right? And you got to go context to, to, to discern what's going on there. So it, it's vital that we do that. So the kind of action may be either punctilier or linear. The context will determine which one is intended. One way to express continuous action in future time is the paraphrastic future construction, and that will be studied later as we get to it. But there's a variety of usages possible for this tense. The first is the predictive future. So in this case, we have John 14, 26. This case is just simple, basic usage of the future tense, predicting an event which is expected to occur in the future. He will teach you all things. All right? And our he is, again, found here. This is he, right? Third person singular. And then here's my future. Didak, didax. Right? So that C tells me it's a combination of a guttural and a sigma. All right? And when I learn my, my stems, verb stems, all right, what's the verb, Brandon? <laughs> Didaco, right? And this is interesting, too, though. Notice... Here it is, he will, right? This is future. He will, you, ponta, all things. He will teach, or if we put it this way, you, he will teach all things. So then you ask yourself, well, why is it worded this way? Because it's not you, humas, that's an object. But right, in Greek, because of the cases, we can move our wording around. So I can change that for emphasis. You, he will teach Ponta all things. So similar expression, I would say, is the same point that's making here. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 4, when he talks to the church of Corinth, and he says to them in chapter 4, he says, I, you, have begotten. He puts the I and you together like that to show the intimacy of the relationship. In other words, the life on life that took place while he was there in Corinth, I, you, have begotten. Because in that context, he's talking about the fact that, hey, you may have many, you may have many tutors, but you only have one father. Right? And Paul then referring to himself. But then he makes sure that he doesn't take credit for their salvation. He says, in Christ, through the gospel, I, you, have begotten. Right? So that's the beauty. Then when we start to see word order, that, that's, right, that's another element to our pulling the text apart and having it tell us something. So that is the predictive future. Progressive future, sometimes the context and nature of the verbal ideas indicates continuous action in future time. In this I rejoice, and indeed, yea, I will continue to rejoice. And that is how I would translate Philippians 1.18. And again, here is, right, we saw this with, with Luke. Yes, kare, sigma, future, connecting vowel, and my Miller passive ending, my, psi, tai, right? Meta, s, and tai. So this is the I right here, my. I myself, we could say, I myself will continue to rejoice. All right? Which even points even more so that resolve that Paul has. There's deliberation that happens here. I rejoice, this is present tense, I rejoice, right, in this, what? In the fact that some are preaching Christ out of, you know, impure motives, some out of pure motives, but as long as he's being preached, in this I rejoice, I'm rejoicing, and indeed, yea, I will continue, right? I myself will continue to rejoice. This is Paul's resolve. But you see deliberation. 
Because sometimes we think Paul's this great commando warrior out there, right? And everything came easy for him. No, there's even deliberation here. I'm rejoicing, and you know what? I'm going to continue to rejoice so long as he's proclaimed, no matter what happens to me. In other words, there is that resolve to whatever comes in the future, even more so harm that might come to him. He's already imprisoned uh, for something he didn't do. Two years in Caesarea, now he's in Rome. He's suffering at the hands of believers. They're trying to do him harm while he's in jail, right? And you have those who are preaching out of impure motives. And all this stuff is going on. Even if it gets worse, I don't care. This is my resolve. I'm just going to continue to rejoice no matter what. That's beautiful because now we, we, we're walking with the man as he's processing the circumstances of his life and the resolve he takes on. Then we realize that if I'm in these kinds of things, I can have that same kind of resolve. I'm not going to let my situations control me. God controls me and I'm going to resolve that I will rejoice. But sometimes in our English, we miss that stuff. We miss the wrestling of the heart. And this is another thing I, I love about understanding how God communicated his revelation, that he used these individuals with their personalities and in the midst of their circumstances. It is God-breathed, right? It is his word to us, but he uses their personalities, he uses their intellect, he uses their education, right? And all of that he uses as a part of his revelation, but it's all divine revelation as the Spirit leads them. So we get that personal element of it, and yet it is nonetheless the word of God. It's awesome, isn't it? When you look at like Luke's gospel and Acts, he uses medical terms all over the place. And he, the participles, the way he uses them, shows his medical training. But it also shows his education. First four verses of his gospel, the words that he uses there are mind-blowing. We don't see it in English, but in the Greek, if any Greek read it, they'd know this man is writing on the level of any great historian. He's writing legit history here. And that's his intent. He wanted people to see that as he walks in. The first two chapters are so Hebraic that the people think that he actually translated from Aramaic into the Greek. And then after the end of chapter 2, he's right into just pure Greek from then on. And it's masterful. So you see the man's education, but you see him divinely led and inspired as he communicated God's word to us. This is great stuff. The imperative future then, sometimes the future will be used to express a command. And this is a very natural idiom considering a command necessarily involves the future. So here we have, the, in reference to calling, you call his name John. Right? This is to be his name. This is the thing I, I this is really cool. You don't have to turn them, but I'll show you. So, in Luke's Gospel... This, this is, every parent should be this way with their kids. So, Zechariah is in the temple praying, right? The angel appears to him. And the angel says in verse 13, the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, right? And it is, to you this son is going to come, right? To you this gift is given as a son, right? And then 14, there will be joy and gladness and all of this, right, going on. Then he's told, you are going to name him John, Right? I, God selected the name, You're calling him John. Here's what's awesome. In his song, prophetic song at the end of chapter 1, it's interesting, verse 76, And you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High. NIV, I believe, says, my child. It's not there in the Greek. He just says, you, child, will be. As much as this child was a gift from God to him, a son of all, right? Because then he could carry on the family name and all of that. When it came down to this prophetic utterance from Zechariah, he does not call him my child. He says child. In other words, he belongs to the Lord. He serves the Lord. He's going to serve the Lord's purpose as a prophet, right? He doesn't even recognize ownership of him. There's a huge statement there. And realize that before I even had kids, and realize that every child that comes, as much as they are a gift to me from God, right? As much as God has shaped them and all that and given to my wife and I to care for, they are His children, ultimately. And they should serve His purpose, whatever that purpose is. The deliberated future, the future is at times found in rhetorical questions, one which does not really expect an answer example Lord to whom shall we go so here is if you will this is my verb stem 
Okay, this is apa, so that's a preposition, drop that off. So here is my true verb stem, leu, right? So here is, and this you could figure out, you know apa, you know the prepositions, right? So you can find those compound words that have the prepositions in front, drop those off, each adds its own thing to it. And so here we have our sigma, this is the future, here's my connecting vowel, omicron, and metha, right? My side tie, metha, este, and tie. So this is my middle and passive ending. But since it doesn't have a theta, eta, it's not a future passive, right? It's a future middle, right? To whom shall we go? <coughs> cool, eh? Awesome. All right, so next time we will pick up some more things about the future tense, but then we will go to look at uh, lesson 10, the uh, uh, perfect. So if you want to read lesson 10 ahead, right, and do that, and then when we come back, we will start into 10 and follow.